Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Larimer. I am the editor-in-chief of Poets and Writers Magazine, and I am delighted to be here uh, with you all. I want to thank the Library of Congress uh, for bringing us all together to celebrate books and the authors who write them. Uh, at Poets and Writers, I've devoted the last 19 years to doing exactly that, so I'm especially happy to be here on this stage uh, in the country's capital. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the National Endowment for the Arts for sponsoring this uh, specific event. And I'm honored to be uh, joined here today by two of the country's brightest literary minds, Lori Moore and Richard Russo. So I'm gonna um, offer a sort of brief introduction for both of them just to remind us all of their amazing accomplishments. And then we will uh, talk for a bit about writing and, and reading and books. Um, and then we will pause for 10 or 15 minutes of uh, questions from the audience. So certainly, uh, you know, be thinking about what you'd like to ask these uh, esteemed authors here. And how about the lights? And is the lights. Ask about the I'm being lights? asked if the lights could come down just a little bit. We're kind of a little... Blinded. Yeah. The blinded lights. is the that's word. A, that's a great... I feel like I'm about yeah. to be blinded beaten. By the blinded light. by the I feel light. like I'm about to be beaten with a rubber <laughs> hose, actually. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible to, to it uh, lower those a little bit. Um, <laughs> okay. They're not listening to us. Okay. Well, hopefully they'll well. they'll they'll dim as we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, Lori Moore is the Gertrude Conaway Vanderbilt Professor of English at Vanderbilt University. She is the recipient of the Irish Times International Prize for Literature a Lannan Foundation Fellowship, and a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, as well as the Penn Malamute Award and the Rhea Award for her achievement in the short story. Moore has written five story collections, including uh, Birds of America and most recently Bark, and three novels, including Gate at the Stairs. Her new book is See What Can Be Done, Essays, Criticism, and Commentary, published earlier this year by Knopf. Richard Russo's novels include Everybody's Fool and That Old Cape Magic. In 2002, he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction for Empire Falls, which was adapted into a award-winning miniseries by HBO. He's also published story collections, most recently Trajectory in 2017. His new book of essays is The Destiny Thief, Essays on Writing, Writers, and Life, published earlier this year, again, by Knopf. Let's Oh, about a round of applause for our screen doctor. <laughs> okay, so um, I have to say I had to chuckle just a little bit when I discovered the, the title for the conversation that we're supposed to be having, which is... You chuckled, we cried. <laughs> <laughs> but the Wept. title here is How Writers Think and Work. Yeah. So I, I we have about 45 really. minutes left. So um, <laughs> Richard... They rejected the if writers think. <laughs> And just went to, yeah. yeah. So how do you think, Richard? You know, What's that? How do you think? Work. No, just kidding. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Slowly. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've been uh, reading, uh, you know, the two, the two new books. Um, and uh, they're both fantastic reads. If you guys haven't picked them up, I really uh, recommend it. It's like sitting down and talking shop with two real masters of the craft. So thank you for these books. They're, they're great. Um, and it's been really interesting to read them um, in preparation for this evening. Uh, because there are some really interesting points of intersection. Um, for example, humor. Okay, so, so Richard, in, a, in a, uh, a chapter titled The Gravestone and the Commode in your book, you write, uh, I know it's a great chapter title, because humor looks easy, people want to know how it's done. My writing students used to ask, how do you make things so funny? To which I usually replied, I don't make anything funny, I'm simply reporting the world as I find it. Um, and, you know, uh, earlier this week, I was actually in Tennessee and southwestern Virginia for work, and I was eating dinner at a diner, and I was the only one there who was eating alone, and I was the only one eating alone while reading a book, and I was the only one re eating alone, reading a book, and laughing out loud to myself. It was your story collection, uh, Bark, oh. and the first story in that, in that uh, collection, de Debarking, mm -hmm. I believe it's called. Right. Um, it's just laugh out loud funny. They looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, so it's, it's very funny. Nobody you, came in and shot you. It was a Waffle House. <laughs> no, it was okay. not a Waffle House, right. no. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you've both been rightly praised for the, for the humor um, in, your, in your fiction. And I won't ask how either of you do it, uh, you know, to your point. But 
I would like to know whether you can sort of identify anything in your life uh, that has made you able, you know, as Richard writes, to, you know, report the world as you find it in this way. Um, you know, was humor valued in your, in your family during your early life um, in a way that sort of um, kind of programmed you to see the world in this way? Or you're looking at you're looking at me. Yeah. You, should I start? You, you begin. <laughs> you begin. We're both from upstate New York, so clearly yeah. <laughs> it's, it's in the water. That's what there. it is. That's it. We can leave it right there. If you're from the, if you're from upstate New York, you got a chance. It's in the Hudson River Valley. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, I think I I discovered my voice as a kind of comic writer. Um, when I began actually to look at my father differently, because um, my parents separated when I was a, when I was a kid, in small town upstate New York. I think I don't I didn't know anybody else uh, whose parents had had separated. My parents hadn't divorced yet, but but I was living with my parents and my maternal my maternal grandparents, um, and they were they were all wonderful wonderful people. I wouldn't have said necessarily that humor was their strong suit. But but they were they were they were wonderful people and and um, I owe them more than I could ever express. But um, because I was living, I think, with with them, who my father was and what his and what his story was, um, wasn't immediately apparent to me when I was growing up. And I only really kind of met him um, when I was. I don't know, I mean, he was always around on the periphery of my, my life, but he wasn't really part of my life until I was a teenager. Mm. And it was only then that I began to process the fact that he was really funny. He was, he was a wonderful storyteller, just a magnificent bullshitter. And um, for any of you who have, who have read the two novels that, that Donald Sullivan uh, is in, Sully, um, those two books were based on, on, uh, on my father. I took wide, deep liberties, but, um, but um, he was a magnificent storyteller. And I used to listen to him telling, tell stories because he was a little bit like Mark Twain in the sense that he used every single audience. You know, he, he paid attention to when people laughed and when... Um, uh, and, and when their attention began to drift away. And he fine-tuned it. Yeah, and yeah. the ne next time, and it was always from one bar to another that we were going <laughs> to, usually on the way home from work. And I, and I, I, began, I began to understand, and, and, and a lot of the guys, a lot of the guys uh, that he worked with, all road construction workers, they were all funny too. They lived hard lives, but they were all funny, funny guys. And I would listen, I would watch my father tell stories and he was so, and he was so funny, and he got, he got funnier, and always the best thing about him was that there was a, usually after he told the story about 20 times, and he'd really, really fine-tuned it, he, then the next day he would tell it to me, having completely forgotten that I was there, <laughs> you know? And so what happened to me at some point was that I began to have, I think, my own, and I was, it was this was, now we're, now we're fast-forwarding probably to almost the age of 30, when I've been trying to be a writer for a while. And we finally, and I finally got to, to the point where it began to dawn on me that all of that stuff that I've been listening to, my father tells stories, his mannerisms, his, 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 his vocal mannerisms, also the way he revised, the way he paid attention to audience, that all of that was stuff that I could actually use and I'd been completely ignoring it, as if it were absolutely valueless. So that was, a turning, that was a turning point for me. I really wanted to be a serious writer. I take comedy seriously, but I wanted to be a, quote, serious writer. Mm -hmm. And, it, went, and it, was, it was when I began to understand uh, what, my father was, what my father had to offer me in my life, not just as his son, but as a writer, that, that, I, that some of that began to crystallize. Mm -hmm. How about you, Lori? Did you have um, something in your... You know, I think, I think everyone... I knew from the beginning of my life was funny. My father too was mm -hmm. very funny um, and would tell, he was a great, also a great storyteller. But I was never a great storyteller, but I paid attention to 
how he told jokes, how he told funny stories. And I told, and I paid attention to how everyone at a, at a gathering, just like if you're getting together with friends for drinks, if you're getting together with your family for dinner, everyone around the table is funny at least once. Hmm. At least once. Hmm. And then you, if you pay attention to what makes it funny, um, then you start to sort of understand comedy a little more and understand it as the grammar of, of conversation and right. socializing. Right. No one gets together not to have a laugh. Everyone gets together to have a laugh and there's nothing funnier than a memorial service. <laughs> right? Absolutely. It's, it's totally a cross between stand up and death <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's really crazy. Yeah. Um, so, con so. And sometimes stand up winning, too, you know, <laughs> strangely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so comedy is just there in our, in our DNA. Yeah. And writers become alert to it, I think, and, and want to sort of put it in there with the tragedy and with the other things that, right. that life consists of. So it sounds like what you're both saying is it's sort of a natural way of, of perceiving things and of course it's going to show up in your work rather than like a tool in your toolbox that right. you're, you, that you're pulling out. That's what yeah. I think. Okay. Yeah. Although it does beg a question of why we don't see more of it. If it's, right. if it's a tool in everyone's tool, uh, toolbox and as Lori says and I completely agree that no, we don't get together to have a bad time. We get together to have laughs. We get to, and, and, right. it, and it is, it's, it's, I, I love what you said about the, being the grammar, the language of, of, how, we, of how we communicate. Um, it does seem to me curious, given how important we both believe it is, that there isn't more of it out there. Uh, I think there's a lot of it though. Yeah, there is, there's, I there's think, a fair amount. Yeah. yeah. I mean, someone once asked me how, how it was that I used humor, like when did I know how to use it? And I said, I would never use humor. I mean, that would be a mean thing to do to humor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> humor is there in the story that you're telling. You have to sometimes find humor right. and, and let it drift and let it come alive right. in, in your text. But right. you shouldn't use it necessarily like yeah. a tool. Yeah. It's just, it's kind of there in your, in your people and in your world yeah. and in your way of looking at things. And as we, as we know also, humor is, a for, is well, the old saying, humor, comedy is tragedy plus time. Yeah, but yeah. humor then obviously means you've survived. So it's, a, it's an expression of survival. Ah, that's um, great. So, and that's a nice thing. Yeah to express your survival. So no matter what happens to you, you can make a funny story of, of it eventually. Right. Well, R Richard, to speak to your, your question, you know, you mentioned something about, you know, I was wanting to write serious fiction. Yeah. And I wonder if that's, a, if that's something that a lot of people or a lot of writers might even unconsciously think that it, you can't have serious, it's not serious literature if it's also funny, which I don't think is true at all, but I just wonder if there's a, you know, a misperception there. I think for me it was almost as much, it wasn't, it wasn't that I, I, I'm, when I say I wanted to be a serious writer, serious in quotation marks, I think more than anything else was that I wanted to be taken seriously, that is, and to, and to, um, and that that was maybe for me the surest sign of being taken seriously was, was becoming a serious writer. Um, and I think that that's just, that has, that just has something to do with my psychological profile as a young man, um, more than anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Shifting gears just a little bit. Yeah. Um, we don't have to give up on the humor, but I different. Never do. different. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Lori, we're going to have to give up on these lights. Though. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Gonna put a, I'm going to have to. It's going to be like saluting yeah, you it's all. A little, but now it's I a can little bright. see you. But, I know <coughs> you can't see the, oh, well. the people. Um, but in um, in a review of Charles Baxter's Shadow Play, which mm -hmm. is included in your in mm -hmm. your new collection, you okay? Yeah. Um, you write often when short story writers go to write novels, they get jaunty. They take deep breaths and become brazen. 
the way shy, <laughs> the way shy people do on wine, which is a very funny line. <laughs> Um, but, you know, you've, you've gone back and forth uh, throughout your career from, you know, stories to novels and, and back again. And I, I'm just wondering if you could, you could talk a little bit about the kind of different modes of writing uh, in both these short and long forms. Um, you know, do you, do you approach the work differently when you know you're sitting down with a novel, writing a novel uh, versus a story? Yeah, I mean, there are writers, and Alice Munro is apparently one of them, who sometimes begin and they don't know whether something's a short story or a novel. And she's right. ostensibly always trying to write a novel. And that's why her stories are so huge and compact and dense and straddle time and they're like little miniature novels. I, I've never had that issue. No. I've okay. always known that it's either going to be a story or it's going to be a novel. Okay. But I mean, I have very few novels. I. The novel gives you a chance to really spread out. See, because of the lights, I can't see what baby this is. <laughs> That's right. Oh. So the lights are too bright for the baby. Oh. The lights are too bright, I agree. <laughs> um, but you, you know, a novel has, obviously offers you just more space, simply. Right. And so you can, you can, and time is often the subject of a novel, so you, and you have more space to explore time, you can handle time differently. There's some stereophonic quality always to a novel. You may have a couple different points of view, or you may have different points of time, or, or you're just you know, carrying a cast of characters through a longer period of time. Um, unless it's Ulysses, and that's just a day. But... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I actually like writing novels, and I'm, I'm working on one now, but every time I then publish one, it gets reviews that say, she should go back to writing short stories. <laughs> so, but I, I persist, you know, it's just resilience and stubbornness. Do you think it's because the, the first book that you had was a story collection, is that? No, I think it's because the first novel I had was bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then people just think all the other ones are bad too, but I don't think so. I think the other ones are better than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. Okay. Richard, how about you? Because you, you also have two story collections. Mm -hmm. um, but you, I, I guess I would argue to say that you're more well known for your novels. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, definitely, yeah. definitely. And I would agree with what, with what Laurie said in, in the sense that most of the time I know, too, uh, when I begin working on something, it has, it has a certain feel to it, uh, whether there's a little material or a lot. And uh, I can usually tell. But there was one exception, um, and that was my novel, That Old Cape Magic, which is kind of interesting because um, I think that the reason it was, an, it, it was always going to be a novel but I think that the reason that I didn't recognize it as such had to do with something else. And that is that it was the novel that I wrote after my longest and most difficult novel. Um, not, all, not all novels cost you the same thing. And this particular novel, Bridge of Size, was um, not only my, probably my most ambitious book, uh, but it was, it was also my most problematic and I made the kind of serious mistakes in it that cost me sometimes 75 or 100 pages at a time. It wasn't that there wasn't anything in those pages, but, but clearly the book was not working. And, and what and it, do you mean by that, not working? Well, it, it just, I mean, I could, I could just tell it wasn't, it wasn't working. I had, I had, one of the things that I did was that there were three main characters in it, and it seemed to me that I was going to tell one character's story, and then another character's story, and then another character's story. But it was, it was and, and so one point of view, then another point of view, then another point of view. And it just, it, just wasn't, it just wasn't working. It was a bad decision. That point of view decision was bad, and it cost me at least a year. And then I made other mistakes like that, just huge, huge mistakes. And long story short, um, by the time I got to the end of it, I had spent about five years, which is even long for me. 
And, and it was also dispiriting because I was making the kinds of mistakes that at that point, for somebody who had written as many books as I had, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be making. At least it seemed to me that I should not be making those kinds of rudimentary mistakes. And it really upset me that I was faithful to those, those, those mistakes for so long, you know? <laughs> <laughs> By God, I was gonna make it work. Um, and so at the end of it, I, my, I was just my, my, my the, the, the needle on my gas gauge was just bouncing off the E, you know? And so when I, when I finished that book and turned it in and it came time to do something else, I started a short story. And it was about a guy uh, who was going to take, um, uh, it was gonna take, it was gonna be a one day story, uh, not like Ulysses, but a one day story. Uh, and it was about a guy uh, who was going to, um, he'd recently been given his father's ashes and he was going to um, put them in the trunk of the car and drive over the Sagamore Bridge. He was living in the Boston area. He was gonna drive on to Cape Cod um, and scatter his father's ashes and come home. That was gonna be the, that was gonna be the story. And um, it was, so I figured going into it, maybe 15 pages, 20 at the tops. Well, it got to be 15, 20, and suddenly the character's mother was introduced and the character's wife was introduced, and, and then it got to be page 35, and I'm thinking, well, it, I can't fob this off. Even in The New Yorker, I'm not gonna, plus it wasn't ending. And then it was at 125 pages, now I'm a novella, what am I gonna do with this? <laughs> and then it got to be about 175 pages, and I thought, this was about the time that On Chesil Beach came out, and I oh, thought, yeah maybe I can fob this off on an unsuspecting public as a novel. That's not you know? very nice to say about Chesil And Beach. I love Chesil Beach, and I love the fact that I he was know. able to... <laughs> but, and, and anyway, the book turned out to be about um, 400 pages. Now, <laughs> now my, my point in, in saying the reason, the reason that I didn't recognize it as a novel, I think, had to do with the fact that if I had recognized it as a novel, I probably wouldn't have begun it. I was exhausted. I was, um, I was kind of dispirited. I would have thought to myself, oh, I'll write a couple of essays, I'll write a book review, I'll write a short story, and, and wait for some more gas to appear in the tank, um, and then I'll start. So basically, I think I just, something in me fooled me into, right, into beginning a novel. Right, had to come in from another yep, yep, angle. Yep. Yeah. I just had dinner with Ann Patchett the other night, because we both, I live around the corner from her mm -hmm. in Nashville. And she said she had just completed a novel and tossed it away. She very ostentatiously huh. said, and I threw it away. I realized I was young enough to write a bad novel. And I said, well, how much would you sell it to me for? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, $1.69. I said, sold. <laughs> and so there's going to be a novel coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Your first collaboration? I don't. It's mine. No, it's going to be yours. You, <laughs> I well, bought it. You did pay for it. You paid, paid for it. I bought it. <laughs> she took an acknowledgement, I'm sure. It'll be fine. She doesn't want to acknowledge no. it. But, you know, whatever. Well, well, it'll be fine. But, but the idea of like, t yeah, of of backing up and and realizing you made all these mistakes and throwing things away, it's so alien to me. But it, mm -hmm. to me, it's a sign of a true novelist, which maybe I'm not. Um, but I'm accumulating all mm -hmm. kinds of things when I'm, when I'm working on this novel that I'm working on, and I don't want to throw anything away. I just won't. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. like a hoarder, you know. So yeah. I, I, I write by hoarding, you know. So that's not good. <laughs> that's why I had to buy Anne's novel. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> She sold it so cheap. But the other point, though, do you, do you ever fool yourself? Have you ever, have you ever discovered that you've, 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 the back of your brain has done something to the front of your brain to just allow you to do something that you otherwise wouldn't have done? I have no idea what you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> I'm, sure, I, I'm sure it's happened that you just didn't recognize it. <laughs> the back of the brain is doing something. Oh, does something come in? Yeah, no. Um, See, I think writers fool themselves all the time about various things. I well, just I, I do walk, and you know this feeling, you, walk, you can walk around for a very long time with either an entire book or a completed book in your head, and you feel like it's completed, and you, and you feel like it's all there, but you haven't put
put it into the sentences mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. You haven't put it into the pages yet, or not entirely. And then when you go to do that, you write a very different book yeah. from the one you were walking around with in your head. Sure, sure. Um, well, one's a book and one isn't, right? I guess that's yeah, right. Yeah. But it's too bad you can't get the one that's in your head yeah, out, uh, yeah, out yeah. there. But it does know? remind you of those people who come up to you and say, I have this great book. This oh, great I idea. Just, I have this, yeah, they have, well, they, sometimes they say it's a book. And they want you and to write it. And it's an idea, it. and, they want you, and they want you to write it. Right. And they say, the only thing I haven't, the only thing I haven't done yet is the words. <laughs> you know? Yeah, the words, very minor. <laughs> Minor problem. <laughs> so, R Richard, just um, the the mistakes that you mentioned yeah. that you had made. Did anybody help you realize that you had made those mistakes? Did you have a reader or an editor or anyone that you could that pointed maybe pointed some things out, or was was it all on your own? Well, for this for this particular book, um, I have my agent to thank, um, Nat Sobel, um, who has been my agent throughout throughout my career, and. Um, with a, lot of, with a lot of Nat's other writers, uh, and with me if I would allow it, uh, with a lot of his other writers, many of them are thriller writers, um, but with a lot of his other writers, they will, they will send Nat pages, you know, chapters at a time, and he'll, he'll comment. And it's, I, I think it's particularly helpful if you're writing a mystery or a thriller to, to get that kind of help sometimes, especially in, in the early going. I'm very resistant to that, and I don't let him, I don't let him see anything until it's done, or until as is the case with Bridge of Size, where I wasn't finished, but I was done. I mean, I was, I, I, I was, I was ready to, I was waving the white flag. Yeah. And um, so I, 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 I gave him the 450 or pages or so of the book, um, which was probably two thirds, um, and he read it, and we went for a long walk during, um, and, and, uh, basically what I was asking him to do was, because I, th I thought I might have had three different books, three different characters, three different books, and he very patiently said, no, it's the same book, but you've got three different, we've got three different characters here, they're equally important, um, and you've got two different locations, there's an American story and an Italian story, and it takes place um, when, they're, when they're young, and then when they're older, so there's no middle in it in terms of their ages. And he said, what, what you're not doing is integrating those three things. And he said, you, what you really need to do is tell what's going on at the end, what's going on at the beginning, what's going on when they're young, what's going on when they're old, and you need to be going back and forth from points of view every 20 or so pages. And I spent the next hour as we were walking explaining to him why that simply could not be done <laughs> and by the end of that time, I realized, of course, that it could be it done. Could be, right. And yeah. perhaps it was the only way it right. could be done. Um, that doesn't happen to me uh, as, as a rule, but I've never, been more th I've never been more thankful to anybody for explaining my own book to me than I was yeah. to Nat right. uh, at right. that point, because I really was at my wit's end. Yeah. How about you, Laura? Do you have uh, early readers or an editor that um, you work with? <clears throat> I, you know, I really believe in that. I believe in showing your work to people, but I used to never show my work to anyone until it was time to sell the book. You know, the yeah. deadline was, and, and I would, and so my agent would be the first mm -hmm. one to look at it, and she's paid to say nice things to <laughs> me, so I, so at any rate, she's a good reader. But more recently, I've, relied on a couple of writer friends to mm -hmm. read. I mean, it's a, it's a huge imposition. Yeah. But yeah. if you can get friends to do it, and they won't say the same things, they'll say right. different things, but you can kind of figure it out from the different things they say, what it is you should do or can do or might do. Um, so if you have some people you trust, it's very important and, and lucky and good. Right. I. I did not work that way for a long time because I was quite stubborn and I didn't believe, you know, I, I had gone to graduate school and gone through that MFA workshop process and listened to everybody's criticisms mm -hmm. and at the, 
And I was so, you know, dutiful and attended all those classes and never missed a one. And at the end of those two years, I said, I'm never showing my work to <laughs> anyone ever again. Until you want to, right? No, yeah. ever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> ever. I didn't want to hear one word about my work. Yeah. Um, so, but now I'm, now I'm a little more flexible. Right. So. Well, and, and you write a lot of reviews. I mean, you, yeah. you know, um, so. Well, not a lot, but I, I, yeah, I've been doing it for a long time, yeah, so right. it looks like a lot. Right, right, right. <laughs> but, you know, so we've talked a little bit about the difference between, you know, the different modes of writing in terms of stories and, and novels, but what about, you both have, you're both very well known and acclaimed for fiction, and your two new books are nonfiction. So, what yeah, what about that? Yeah. <laughs> what are we doing? I don't know, but I'm never going to do it again. <laughs> But what you know um, is, it, uh, what's it like to approach your nonfiction work versus your fiction? Um, is it a different switch that you kind of flip to totally well, different Rick's, headspace? Or? Rick's books are really about the writing life and and personal essays about mm -hmm. the writing right. life. Mine are, res you, mine are critical pieces by and large. There's some. There's some personal essays in there, very few. There's a great uh, one called On Writing, which is very good in, there's in a, there. Oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's one on writing. There's one on my honeymoon. Because <laughs> here's, here's the difference between nonfiction and fiction. When I got married, we went to the courthouse, and the 60 Minutes crew was there to film us getting married. It's you such a lovely story. <laughs> I, I love you it. cannot <laughs> make that up. And that's the difference between fiction and nonfiction. So that's why I had to write a personal essay about that. Right, right. And that is, in, that is in the book. Then no one would publish it. But you know, that's a different story. Um, but you Nobody wanted to publish that? Well, someone commissioned it, and then they killed it. I got a kill fee for it. Oh, and terrible. Then, and then my, my poor agent said, that's just I think she found it so depressing, yeah. you know, and she said, let's just put this aside. Yeah. And so then I put it back in this book. So it's one of the few pieces that had never appeared before. But in writing a work of fiction, you couldn't very well ha have a fictional couple right. go to get married at the courthouse and then take off for their honeymoon. And there's a 60 minutes right. camera crew who wants them to pose as a welfare couple. That's what the 60 Minutes crew wanted us to do. Did you know they were there when you no. arrived? No. <laughs> Just no. You, that's why you can't make this up. Um, they said, we're doing a story on the governor's welfare program, you know, where if welfare couples get married, they get more money. This, this was a Clinton thing, too. He adopted it from the Wisconsin governor. But we forgot to get footage of a, of a couple getting married. Would you pose as a welfare couple getting married? And I said, and my and my husband, my then husband said, Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> I was like, Are you out of your mind? That's right. No, no, no. So, you know, the first <laughs> the first That's yeah, that's better yeah, nonfiction. One of my that's, first yeah. words of you right. know <laughs> no. in the courthouse was no, no, no. <laughs> And we were divorced 10 years later, so. <laughs> but, you, but you can't, and the camera crew was so disappointed. They, yeah. they said, no one will notice you. And then, of course, my father was disappointed because I then phoned him that night and said, he you know. He wanted you to do he it. He said, yeah. you should have posed as that welfare <laughs> couple because then I could have seen you get, oh, right. get sure. married. Sure. Did it? But if you put this in fiction, it's, it's not only, it's just, it's just unbelievable, yeah, right. I think. Right. Kind of insulting that they thought you would pass, isn't it? They were going to film from the back. You should <laughs> <see it. laughs> I don't know. I don't know what, I mean, anyone can be on welfare. We should have been on welfare. <laughs> well, I was going to say, you're a writer, so you're... you're yeah, you're, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we had no money, but yeah. we were, you know, whatever. Yeah. Not technically on welfare. Well, Richard, how about you, just in terms of the nonfiction versus fiction? Well, what I discovered in the two nonfiction books, because I've written the memoir, which is supposedly, it's supposed to be nonfiction. Uh, 
And then I wrote this book of this book of personal essays, which are also supposed to be nonfiction. What I discovered, to my delight, and and um, I have to say a little bit um, embarrassment, is that I didn't find them as di as different as different as I thought I was going to, and as I probably should have, <laughs> um, because for me the storytelling the storytelling urge kicks in, and I, and when I was writing uh, the memoir. I mean, obviously, I didn't. I wasn't going to make things up. The story, the story that I was telling was, was was too important, and 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 it was more about my mother than me. And I wanted to do right by her, even though I was writing a book that I knew she would hate. Uh, but but still, I was I was I was I was writing a story. And um, I found myself, for instance, making decisions that a fiction writer makes, where a different writer telling the story would have told uh, would have told a part of the book through narration that I just decided to tell in scene. I slowed I slowed the narrative down. Um, could I remember exactly what my mother and I said to each other 30 years ago? No. But I did know the conversation that we had been having all of our adult lives. And I could reconstruct that in a way that was true in terms of the way I, it was, it was the kind of truth that I was after in the book. And I think that as people, as readers read that, you either accept that or you don't. I mean, one kind of reader would say, there's no way in the world that Richard Russo can remember what he and his mother said to each other in the car on the way to Arizona from upstate New York when he was 18 years old. That just doesn't happen. And it certainly doesn't happen if you know me. Um, but there were other readers who were willing to give me that license, even in nonfiction, and say, OK, he's not, he's not asking us to believe exactly this moment in time, but that's what it was like. And so, and I found that, I found that in, in the most personal of the essays in this book, um, I, found, I found that to be true as well, the most personal uh, essay in it is called Imagining Jenny. It's about my dear friend Jenny Boylan and uh, what she was going through um, about 10 or 15 years ago, between 10 and 15 years ago, um, as she transitioned from, from male to female. And um, I was actually um, a character in, in, her, in her memoir about all of this. And, it came, and, and so I wrote this as, as the afterword to her book. And I wanted to, I really wanted to write that and tell it as a story and did it completely before I even showed it to her because I really wanted it to work as a story. And afterwards, fortunately, there was nothing in it that, that she objected to. But I'm sure that if we were talking literal truth, there were probably times when she would have said, oh, I don't remember it quite that way. You know, mm -hmm. I think actually, it was more like this. And once in the memoir, um, where I'm talking about my daughter Kate's wedding, I wrote a scene in that, in which, and I have it at, at the wedding, at the, at the reception after the wedding, and both of my daughters came up to me and said, yeah, that's kind of what happened, but actually it happened before the night of the rehearsal dinner. Mm. Mm. And so I had a choice. And I kept it right where I, right, yeah. right where, right where I had it. Right. That's where it worked. That's right. <laughs> right. You're the writer. You're the writer. Right. The sloppy memory of, yeah. of fiction writers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, that's why we go there. It, you know. Yeah. You don't have to be careful. Right. right. Yeah. Well, we're starting to run out of time, but I, I have a whole lot of questions. But I want to get to some audience questions. But before we do, one quick one. This is the National Book Festival. It's all about books. What are you guys reading right now? Any book recommendations for, for everyone? I, I'm making my way through Prairie Fires, the biography that won the Pulitzer Prize, right. I think, of Laura Ingalls Wilder. It's, it's, it's a great history of the Midwest, brutal, brutal history. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not, it's not a, a sweet little house on the prairie right. story. Right. It's quite bloody and awful and fascinating. I am now reading uh, a novel um, that I've been wanting to read since it since it came.
came out. And I'm blanking on the author's last name. Somebody in the audience is going to be able to provide it, though. It's, a, uh, it's, it's called Only in Sleep. And it is by an author. Uh, I've read a couple of, other his, couple of other of his books, which I liked a lot. But this book uh, was commissioned by Raymond Chandler's estate. And he was commissioned to write another Philip Marlowe, another Philip Marlowe novel. And boy, does he nail it. I'm about halfway through. And he, re and he, he imagines Marlowe as the novel takes place in 1988, which makes Marlowe, um, who's been in retirement for many years, he is in his early 70s. Imagine Philip Marlowe uh, <laughs> in, his, in his 70s, having retired to Mexico. Lawrence, anybody? Osborne? Yes, Lawrence Osborne, thank you. Um, okay. And it's, I mean, who would, who would, who would dare, who would dare to pretend to be either Philip Marlowe <laughs> or Raymond Chandler? Right. It's, it's not for the faint of heart, and it's, it's a lovely, it's a lovely book. You'll, you'll like it. Excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I just want to plug, uh, Barbara Kingsolver has a novel coming out in October. It's called Unsheltered. I finished it. It's great. Absolutely okay. great book. So, be on the lookout for that. Uh, okay, so we have a few minutes, about seven minutes, for some questions from the audience. Does anybody have no, a they're question? They're taking the opportunity <laughs> to leave. <laughs> Anyone? Keep in mind that we can barely yes. see the audience. Yes. We, can so we have someone we at the microphone so. here, though. Yes. A bunch of us, Richard, are looking forward to hearing you on... I'm over here. <laughs> yeah, right. but where is here? Right. Over here. Right. <laughs> we can't see. It's over there. We're, okay. we're oh, looking okay. forward to hearing the you at the F. Scott Fitzgerald celebration where you will be honored this year as our honoree. And I know that towards the end of trajectory, there's a beautiful passage. There's a passage in one of the stories where you reference Nick Carraway. But I'd like to sort of spin off of the question on what you're reading now and ask what shaped both of you, uh, what, what literary lights made you the way you are, which is wonderful, both of you. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, no, go, go, go. I, you know, I don't, personally, I don't really feel that I'm shaped, I, I know I'm shaped by everything, I, what, is, it, is the question it's really scary. over here? Yeah, it's just right there. <laughs> over oh, there. there. Oh, hi. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, but I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm shaped by everything that I read. It like it's all food. Go, all goes in. It all nourishes you. Um, there are. There are sometimes when I've explicitly sort of done a bounce off of another writer's story, and it still doesn't seem anything like that writer's story. It's not. So I mean. You, one has literary heroes. I don't think that, that one's work is necessarily formed by them at all. If only. That would be so great. <laughs> um, but you take, you take a little inspiration and, uh, uh, just by virtue of the fact that you know there are things in the world that are this beautiful to read and you just want to also be part of that project. So, go ahead. Um, my novel, Straight Man, begins with an epigraph from, from Fitzgerald. Uh, is it Myrtle, I think, who is it? Early in the, early in the book, they're at a party, uh, and Nick is talking to this woman, Myrtle, and, uh, who has a dog, and uh, she says, it's, it's, it's just such brilliant, such, such brilliant dialogue. She says, they're nice to have a dog. And, they, and I, I love the way that goes from the plural, they, <laughs> to the singular, a dog. There's something about that that's just, it's just so rich with that woman's voice, that, that, uh, that shift from the, from the plural to the singular locates her in terms of class, and um, it's, just, it's just wonderful. And those are the, you pick up little things like that wherever you go, wherever you read, um, you, you, you find... Um, Little things. I think most writers read with larceny in their hearts, and <laughs> and it, it, it's not that you're gonna it's not that you're gonna steal it now and use it now. It's that you 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 put it away in that little closet 
uh, and you think that'll 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 you know do me well at some point if I if I remember it. And I, and I remember I think I remember thinking that way about Fitzgerald too in, in terms of the Great Gatsby, understanding really for the first time what the difference is between a book being about a character and a book being that character's story. Because that's a stark example of that, isn't it? It's, it's, it's about Gatsby, but it's not Gatsby's story, it's Nick's story. And I, I think it was that book that, that I, I began to, I mean, I understood it kind of intellectually the way we do sometimes, you'll understand something, but it made sense to me, I think, for the first time. Okay, another question over here. All right. Thank you for a wonderful and funny conversation today. I didn't expect it would be this funny. Uh, so I was wondering, you talked about how stories grow up in your hands and sometimes they turn into short stories or novels. But I was wondering, what is that moment like when the story is born in your head? Like one minute it's not there and the other minute it's there. And what is that? Where is it coming from? Where is that? Uh, light of ray coming into your head and uh, bringing this beautiful story to existence? I, I think, for me, I mean, for every writer it's a little different. For me, stories begin with an emotion. I mean, sometimes it's language and characters and voice and setting that sort of spur you on. But for me, I'm very interested in a complicated emotion and what kind of story could contain that, not e express it, not um, describe it, but actually contain it so that a reader could walk in to, the, to a narrative and have that same feeling. I think I've lost the questioner in the lights. <laughs> There's a, there you are. Um, ra wrap it up, it says. Yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> So, and then once you have that emotion and you, ha you build a world that can contain it in a voice, you wrap it up. That's right. <laughs> okay. Wow. Um, uh, um, <laughs> Wrong lights. Yeah, now they're <laughs> <laughs> Wrong lights. Okay. Um, yeah, we're supposed to wrap it up, so I'll just say very quickly. Uh, I agree with Lori. The, those moments where you, the, the aha moments in the, in, in the story, it, it'll, it'll come in, in dif at different times in different books. Um, sometimes it'll be a character revelation, sometimes it'll be something. I, I remember very distinctly in Empire Falls, there was a moment, and I was at least halfway through the book, when I thought to myself, oh, this book is about cruelty. And I didn't know that before. Um, and so you, we, we love those. We love those when suddenly we know something today that we didn't know yesterday. But it's, it comes, in, it, it's different, different in each book. Rachel Cuss says every good story is about cruelty. I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. <laughs> I, know. I know. I think it's, it's, it's worth thinking about. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Laura. Thank you.